Hello everyone, my Good name evening. is Sean. I'm Alex. We're diving right into it today, uh, as you may be able to hear, because we have quite the episode. We suddenly got super inspired to talk about coastal manufacturers. The best rides, most notable. Yeah, so even though the title is going to say, or is saying, the best coaster of each manufacturer, best it's really hard to say. Subjective. It's subjective. You know, there's subjective. coasters we haven't written yet, there's coasters you haven't written yet, and yeah. we'll probably have disagreeing opinions there, but we do want to talk about some of the more notable ones, mm -hmm. whether that's notable on paper, whether it's notable in our own experience. And most of these we've written, but some we know, we know some of the most notable coasters of a manufacturer are not necessarily rides that we've been on, but we still want to talk about those. And we're pretty confident that we're going to get some coasters discussed here that um, you have maybe not heard of. But they're big attractions from modern it's manufacturers. It's easy to talk about like the best roller coasters in the world, but to talk about every manufacturer, which we're talking about, virtually every designer manufacturer of roller coasters that specializes in anything beyond basic production model rides, and say this is the best that this company did, and it's worth talking about because of that achievement for that company, what that was for what that ride means to the park that it's located in. And there'll be some, yeah, like there'll be some current ones, um, you know, that are still alive, but also some trendsetters and yeah. some really important players in the industry that are no longer with us, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. And if you don't hear your favorite manufacturer in the next hour and a half or so, um, we do plan on creating a part two that we're actually going to record right after this. Um, so it'll be kind of like a, a long episode split into, so you don't have to two parts, be too yeah. bothered by it. And if you listen to it this early, you have to wait for our next episode to drop. Yeah. Um, but we're going to talk about every single notable manufacturer, um, including some of your favorite knockoff Chinese ones. So mm -hmm. we'll dive right in with um, the one I think we struggled with the we're most. We're starting with the hardest one. Can you guess? I'm sure you guessed already. It's Intamin. Intamin. <laughs> and Intamin is hard because, first of all, they have so many products that haven't been written yet. I mean, we are we, we, we were planning on writing some of uh, the new big Intamin projects in China this year, but that obviously, obviously didn't happen. Didn't, didn't, yeah. Uh, however, there's there's just so many things Intamin's been doing, kind of always we, pushing the envelope. The really. sky's the limit for Intamin, and we, frankly, can't keep up. It's not like they build the best coasters to their name and then take a break for a few years and then push the envelope again, like, later. Intamin, everything that Intamin builds is their best work. The best Intamin coaster in the world hasn't been built yet. <laughs> it just continues to grow and expand. And that's not to say that some of their older rides aren't excellent, um, but I would say that they just continue to trend up and up and up. Um, I think the first major notable game changer for Intamin for us that we want to talk about is Skyrush. Yeah, Skyrush gets... Uh, it the industry seems to be kind of on two sides of a fence here. Some absolutely love Skyrush and some absolutely hate it. I, I agree it's brutal. But I really enjoy the intensity. I just feel like I'm going to die every time I write it. And I love that. It's unforgettable. Even... I mean, it's intense not just by American standards but on a, on a global... Level we we find that the, a lot of the most intense roller coasters in the world are uh, overseas. They're not in North America, but a lot of North America's most intense rides are Intamin, Skyrush, I three hundred five, Fury, or not, not Fury, <laughs> Maverick. Excuse me, I three hundred five, <laughs> Maverick. We'll talk about Fury later. Actually, that'll be in the next episode. Um, and like El Toro, like Intamin is in a league of their own as far as pushing the boundaries of what their clients might think is an acceptable level of intensity for the American palate. And Intamin does have a bit of a stigma that their rides don't necessarily operate with um, consistency and getting an Intamin online is almost like a, it's almost like a running joke. But I feel that I kind of forget about that even being a problem when I think about how incredibly limit pushing some of these rides are. Like, yeah, I'm not surprised that you had to take part of I threw a five out and replace it because I'm still dying on that. There's, and they're getting you know? better. Like, they're, Intamin is not the cable-snapping vigilantes they used to be. I will say, all the new Intamins we've chased in the recent years, they've always been open. Yeah. We even got on, uh, on Dueling Dragon at Guangzhou Sunak Land, mm -hmm. uh, another combination. Yeah. The Dueling Sit-Down Invert LSM combo, which, of course, we only wrote the sit-down side, but... It wasn't Intamin's fault. It's a cost-cutting measure for that park. They could barely afford to keep the gates open, let alone run both sides of their dueling coasters. So 
We were salty, but all is forgiven. I really liked that park, and I would go back. It's close to the airport, you know. It's easy. It's good to hit on Hit it on a six-hour layover in uh, in Guangzhou. Why not? Um, And I think as far as, like, there's just so much to talk about with, like, the new, the like the, the the current generation of Intamins, things like the mega coaster that's under construction at Wallaby Belgium, which the, looks completely out of control. That I mean, it, it starts out as like a like a mutated Goliath at Wallaby Holland, and then transforms into a Blitz coaster, violent airtime, crazy sharp transitions, it's like a tail end that's not unlike a ride like Tyron or a Taiga at uh, Linden Maki in Finland. And that's exactly the point. So, Taiga, we haven't written yet, um, but we're hearing it's one of the very best products out there. Um, then there is Soaring Through Clouds in Nanchang. Is that also Nanjing? We have Roller Coaster Database well, to assist. Please hold. <laughs> yeah, because there's so many names. You of guys know, if, if you're familiar with some of Intamin's more crazy proje- projects in China, um, is it Coasting Through Clouds? That's. It's the it's the hyper coaster that starts up with a a giant elevated turn. It's the orange and green and then one drops. located in the. God, it's, it's the same park as Python and Bamboo Forest, right? Yes, it is. I mean, so just, t- just put Python on. and Bamboo Forest. And yeah, you guys, yeah. So it is yeah. Nanchang, Nanchang, Sinek Land, which we were planning on going to this year. Obviously, that didn't happen, but we'll go. We'll go later. Eventually. Yeah, so Nanchang Simic Land is home to Python and Bamboo Forest, which we'll get to GCI, GCI a little later. Yeah. Um, but the park is particularly famous currently Coaster for... Coaster Through the Clouds. That's Coaster what it's Through the Clouds. Now. It's had a few name changes. And that is a massive intimate coaster built in 2016 <laughs> to has- rifle Disney, actually. The Wanda Group that mm-hmm. opened the park had fierce words saying that this would compete uh, among other parks in the region with Disney and put Disney at a loss when they opened. Obviously, that didn't happen. That's all <coughs> That's all false. But this yeah. is in the Jiangxi area of mm-hmm. uh, the province of China. Uh, I would say it's probably about a two, three-hour train, train ride, ride away from, from Shanghai, Shanghai area. This ride is bonkers. Like, it is a, a I, mile If you haven't almost. Googled this ride, coasting through clouds, it's, it, yeah, it's a mile long, 255 foot first drop, but it has a panoramic 180 at the top of the lift hill first. And, and then it's it quite just, unique that if you ride a coaster in China, and you're actually above the buildings yeah. because Chinese buildings are so effing tall. So tall. But then you're riding this thing, and I cannot wait to ride it. Um, but yeah, it is standing 243 feet tall with a drop of drop. 256 yeah. uh, foot. 78 degree drop, very steep. It almost looks like we took I-305, but instead of just staying on the ground the entire time, we put in some big elements. I-305 with a lot of height. But uh, it, there's there's some significant There's some great head choppers on this, on this thing. I mean, it's just no mid-course break run. It's just hauls ass the whole way. Um, definitely a bucket list Intamin for us, if, if ever there was one. I mean, I can't think of another Intamin that would be higher on my bucket list, except for maybe the... Um, Oh yeah, this one that you're and they're not out. too far away in Hefei, which Hefei is soon really out. easy to combine these two parks. They're only mm-hmm. a few hours from soaring each other. With Dragon. They're soaring with Dragon, which is a, a 200 foot tall Intamin shuttle. Yeah, coaster. it's a hyper swing launch coaster. So an LSM coaster, lap bars, and it has a really beautiful layout with a non averting loop, and then a kick ass looking dive loop, like a crazy looking dive loop where you're stalling for the majority of the elements. And then it just kind of meanders around the park and around some giant dragon statues, and it looks really cool. But it's another one of those like coasters we've heard so many great things about. Yeah. We haven't actually gotten to ride yet. Yep. We'll go. So again, that's one of the reasons why this like episode. For every great Intamin we've written, like Steel Dolphin or Thunder Dolphin, two of our favorites uh, in China and Japan, respectively. Um, for every great Intamin we've written, there seems to be another Intamin that uh, is blowing people's minds in some corner of another country, and. We'll get there someday. But I will say that <coughs> overall, Intamins do run together. Not necessarily like from ride to ride, but in a sense that they all kick butt. Yeah. And I don't think ever in an Intamin where I was like, oh, it's this so is, hard you know, to pick them apart. This is not that great. And yeah. maybe the older ones, like yeah. Millennium Force. But back in the day, that was a limit pushing, yeah. crazy. Not all Intamins age that well, but some of them do age really well. Um, like Wicked Twister, I think, has aged pretty well. It's, it's pushing 20 years old. It's still, in the grand timeline of Intamin rides, it's one of the older Intamin launch coasters. Volcano was cool, rest its soul. <laughs> rest its soul. It was so ahead of its time. It was basically an inverted blitz coaster. Two launches, 
multiple inversions. I mean, it, it, that was just a classic Intamin move of like, we're not even sure if we're going to be able to do this, but man, we're going to friggin' try if we can. Oh, U shaped coaster. Sean's looking up the. Uh, there's an Intamin half pipe wing coaster that was built at Victory Kingdom in China. It's already closed. Sad day. Very China. So sad. I heard it was great. We have friends who wrote it, and they're like, God, I can't believe that ride's already gone. And it actually had an exclusivity clause on that, so they couldn't, we'll never, they couldn't yeah. clone it. So I don't think we'll see it. I, don't th- it's I think great. it's still late now. People don't want basic yeah. rides like that. Um, it looks cool, though. But yeah, overall, there is, um, there's, just so, there's just too much for us to... We're probably going to launch a, a series of like industry highlights, and Intamin is obviously a, a key candidate for that, because there's for, not only is there a bunch of great... Intamin rides coasters to talk about, but also non coasters as well. Like we could talk all day about Intamin's non roller coaster limit pushing, everything from drop rides to parachute towers. I to mean, even drop ride wise, pirate Intamin ship has rides. done some crazy stuff. They have attached drop rides to existing structures yeah. like Kanaka and Superman. Yeah, but also on one of the tallest buildings in the world, yep. the, the Canton Tower in Guangzhou. Fourth Guantaro. tallest building in the world has an you're, Intamin giant drop. You're nearly 2,000 feet up in the air, and there is on top of the building an Intamin attached to the antenna of this mega skyscraper in one of the largest metros in the entire world. It's so far in I the future, I can't believe how man. fairly crazy it is. And it's like, oh, yeah, but of course it's Intamin. Yeah. Because, like, um, who else only is Intamin cool that, you would know? have the audacity, you know? So overall, but, like, we have really yeah. grown into Intamin boys. I feel like I used to kind of be like, oh, God, Intamin's for fanboys, especially yeah. before the new age Intamin's came out. And yeah. Everyone was like on the never-ending millennium Sometimes force Sometimes you ride a ride like Fahrenheit and it shakes a lot. It's not running like it could or, or you're, you know, attempt to ride Accelerator and it's closed for six months. <laughs> and you're just yeah. like, uh, like, God, Intamin, why? But, but like, I this think is that why. once I-305... Came around, I think I started realizing that Intamin was was up to something. Kind of yeah, half a yeah. I started building all this cool shit now. Yeah. And I think ever since, Intamin has been the stronger manufacturer than it's ever been. Like, Hagrid isn't the most consistent ride in the world, but it's better than when the launch coasters, the Intamin Neo launch coasters were coming out. I mean, it's they've come a long way as far as reliability at that end. Hagrid has so much going on that it's a miracle Trek that Tracks switches, seven launches, drop it's tracks. A miracle. It's so like, it's much It's such going a cool on. ride. But and I feel like there's only a few manufacturers you can really kind of ask that for at a budget. And, you know, to my mind, come yeah. Fakoma and Intamin, um, yeah. who can actually Fakoma, fulfill Intamin, these sort of, like, custom Mac. projects. Yeah. So, um, big place for Intamin. I really like it. And we'll probably launch a full episode on yep. Intamin. I can't wait to talk about uh, Velocicoaster. That's we'll, right. That'll be the next. We'll probably know a little more about it when we launch that episode. That'll be the next great Intamin success story. People will come to Florida to get an unparalleled Intamin fix before you know it. And All the right. next couple we're going to dive into are going to be a little quicker because we're not trying to get Intamin you bored. Intamin was the big one. Intamin was the big one, and we thought it was a good one to start with. However, now we're going to dive into something you may not have yeah. heard of, and maybe you have. Um, first off, we got Kumbach. Kumbach. Kumbach has one roller coaster to the its name. The little Dutch company that could. Well, could they? Is the question. Because <laughs> Flegel the Hollander, which is the only the flying Dutchman Efteling for you guys Efteling's water coaster is the only 100% comeback mm-hmm. project. Um, wonderful ride. It's yeah. like one of my absolute favorite rides out there. We have a couple so people on the great. team that yeah. will definitely agree with that. Yeah. Um, best queue, best station. Americans awesome might be more ride. familiar with Kumbach for some of the trains that they've built for existing rides. Uh, like T2. For better or T3. for worse, T3. If you've ridden T3 at Kentucky Kingdom, you've ridden a Kumbach train. Um, if you've ridden Phantom's Revenge at Kennywood, Kumbach uh, rewired that ride and provided the the computer, the brain for that ride somewhere along the way. I can't remember if it happened during the initial remodel of that yeah, ride. Yeah, Kumbach is one of those companies that like keeps existing and yep. keeps itself busy, but building coasters isn't their thing, and they got one shot at it because they're located so close to Efteling. They are in the same, if I'm not mistaken, province. Yeah, uh, which I can check real and, quick. Like, I mean, they killed it. They are right next. Their one province over. But it's the, a small country, the so. standard's very high for a park like Efteling. If you've been there, you know that every ride there has to hit the mark um, because the, the standard of quality for this place is so high. And Bling the Hollander's no exception. And though a troubled project, um, it need it. It did what Efteling needed. Yeah, it has high capacity. It has a dark ride section. Um, it is a after all, a successful attraction that really is one of Efteling's finest. So, 
Yeah, good looking school. Um, I like what they do for the industry. Yeah. I don't really think I need to see any more roller coasters from them yeah. because it's been 13 years. I don't know if they'll build another coaster, but they're still kicking. Yeah. They're still out there doing whatever their client needs them to do. They are a chameleon. Um, okay, moving on to one of the legacy developers for what the first of three legacy Japanese developers that we're going to talk about on this particular episode is Meisho. Meisho, um, mixed bag for me personally. Yeah. <laughs> um, I'm like trying to think of what's the best roller coaster I can Okay, mention. well, the, be all, be, but. the most iconic thing that Meisho ever did, of course, was Moonsault Scramble, which was... It's a Vacoma co- It was sign, a Vacoma right? design. Yeah. It was a work... Bet- it was a collaboration between Vacoma and Meisho, one of the most iconic roller coasters to ever grace the earth. 200 and... It's like a 203-foot tall pretzel loop shuttle ride that Fuji Q Highway installed in 1983. When it was built, it was by far the tallest roller coaster in the world. It pulled uh, six and a half Gs. It was so violent that um, even with one train operations, man, uh, I don't believe that the capacity for that ride was ever too much of a problem because of how uh, terrifying it may be. Of course, having said that, Fuji Q Highland is the kind of place that has really groomed a, uh, a, 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 a thrill-seeking audience. So there were days, I think, where Boot Salt Scramble probably had a line for hours, but that's just kind of the nature of the beast. What are you looking at? I'm looking at the fact that they apparently built a roller coaster for the Shenzhen Bay Hotel, which we were looking up the other day because there was a job opening there. Long story short, it's very Shenzhen. I guess that back in 1984, there was a May Show <laughs> coaster there. There's a couple of May Shows that we've actually ridden. Um, Labyrinth at Himeji Central Park uh, near Osaka, and uh, also in Osaka is a fantastic coaster rowdy. Those, I believe, are the only two May Shows that we've ridden. And Meisho is based in Osaka, so um, those almost seem like no-brainers. But it's interesting because they're found all over, mostly China. Uh, sorry, mostly Japan. There's a couple outside of Japan, like there's one in South Korea. Yeah, there was um, one famously, the Thunderbolt, um, in Australia, Dreamworld. It ran there for a very long time. There, but I guess at that point, it's, it's the one that's yeah. close to manufacturing. Every once in a while, you'll see. I mean, all three of these legacy uh, Japanese designers we're talking about all. Uh, were able to to cast the stone outside of, of China and or outside of Japan and even outside of Asia. Yeah, there's Labyrinth. You remember that one? It was like the magenta one. Yeah, it was almost like a little mind. Labyrinth train and Fantastic Coaster miles. Rowdy were both like really cute family wild mousey um, type rides. I found them to be really enjoyable. We haven't we we didn't ride any of, of Meisho's you know major legacy designs. There aren't a lot of them around anymore, sadly. Um, but the ones that are still around, we really enjoyed. And Next one we're talking about. Senyo. Another company is located in Osaka is yeah. Senyo Kogyo. Unlike Meisho, Senyo Kogyo is still in operation. I think I think Meisho. It's funny because they have the less of, pro- of they have Togo. less overall coasters, but I think more people may be familiar with this because um, diving coaster Vanish is yeah. is a Senyo Kogyo. Yeah. Now, if you haven't listened to our podcast episode about that ride, Yokohama Cosmo World. Where the park was cute, but that ride was miserable. The ride was is so, is so cool to look at. There's a reason why it goes viral. Every couple of years, like it's spec. I had a ball taking pictures of that ride, but it was a one and done um, for us. Senyo Kogyo actually can, could build you a whole theme park. A lot of Yokohama Cosmo World's rides are Senyo Kogyo, including like their um, their giant Hus Skylab knockoff. Oh yeah, that was actually pretty. Hus Skylabs, those are the giant um, Enterprise, Enterprise rides. rides, the cabins that hold up to four adults. Um, Senyo Kogyo has had some success selling. Um, you know, very lovingly crafted <laughs> knockoffs of uh, of like hus rides that either um, are are not cost efficient for a park in Japan to build, or just aren't being manufactured anymore. Like I don't I don't think Hus makes the Skylab anymore, but Senyo Kogyo will build you one. And then Senyo Kogyo, much like Emeshio and in a way Togo as well, it's it's pretty well known for their oh, jet I coasters. That one. I wonder if which you rode at Suzuka, Suzuka Circuit. Circuit. So a pretty famous international location. That was a fun one. Uh, it was called Rocky Coaster. Last car was backwards. We rode it backward. That's right. It kind of hurt, but it was really fun. It was neat. Um, and Legroom actually wasn't that bad on that coaster compared to some of the other Senyo Kogyo. Remember Family Banana been. Coaster? Girl. And I Coral Truck. Family Banana Coaster and Coral Truck were both on that trip, and they were both Senyo Kogyo Kitty Coasters where you were able to sit sideways and dispatch the train. 
Yeah, well, that was kind of wild. I can't believe they actually dispatched a train with me. Not <laughs> but they were so gentle. A they single were so bit gentle. Of what else? What else? Oh, oh, okay. Camelback, the big, the big jet coaster that was at Himeji Central. That was Senyo Kogyo. That was a good one. And Red Falcon at um, Hirakata Park. Red Falcon was actually that really was really good. dope. Yeah, it well, looked like a kind of like an arrow looper. But so Red Falcon was interesting because um, it had a really unique track system. The track bed was neat. where it was based on. Um, you know, like an aero track system, like the old aero track systems. But instead of the track tilting with the spine, yeah. the spine was always in place. And yeah. if the track had to tilt, then one part of the track was taller than the other. Yeah. So, like, the track could get really bulky, but it sure looked cool. Yeah. And it rode really well. Of, yeah. Smooth. For banking, it was – and it was smooth. They had they had something right there with that because banking the turns rather than – them, yeah, like rather than with them like tilting the track to the that degree, they would bank the turns just by raising the cross ties on that individual rail. And like first, I was like, oh god, this looks like it's this gonna be miserable. Like but it was really, really it fun. Was fun. It was ride. very smooth. And uh, next up is everyone's favorite everyone's Japanese, the legacy coaster daddy of Japan, Togo. Togo. I do want to say though that people love to hate on Togo, but I'm gonna tell you right now, Togo is infinitely better than Meshio. Yeah. Or Senyo Kogyo, in my opinion. Like, and all if, the Togos you, Asia if you think great. you hate Togo, you probably hate Togo International. Which made the U.S. products, yes. like um, Surf... Windjammer, Surf Racer, and the Big Apple Coaster, which we still like that ride. I don't we like Big Apple says. Coaster, but thanks to the new yeah, trains, it's, really. Yeah, Premier has probably been single-handedly responsible for keeping that ride even remotely palatable. Well, the first um, shout-out to Togo I want to give is actually kind of a sad one. Because um, one of our first projects was the Cyclone at Tarshimine, oh, uh, which just closed uh, a month, so less than a month ago. Yeah, um, that the was ride such was a great ride. Because the park will be turned into a Harry Potter kind of like movie studio experience. Supposedly. Supposedly. Warner Brothers bought it. We'll see what happened. Um, so, but that ride was really, really cool. And it's like a giant jet coaster. I'm pretty sure it's when the jet coaster was born. Yeah. It was awesome. Well, yeah, Togo's second project is the one at Hanaya Shiki, the one that I rode in 2017. And that was built in the 50s. It's it's older than, like, I think it's older than Matterhorn Bobsled. Um, Togo was just way ahead of their time. They were building really sturdy track beds out of steel back when most U.S. designers were still building, like, kitty coasters and mad mouses out of two-dimensional flatbed, like, railroad cross yeah, configurations. Yeah, for, for those that don't quite understand the relationship that the U.S. has with hypercoasters. It came from Bandit, yeah. a Togo product uh, near Tokyo, in, uh, yeah, in, Yomiuri, uh, land. Yomiuri Land. That was the sole inspiration for Arrow yeah. attempting, yeah. along with Cedar Point, to build a hypercoaster. Dick coaster. Kinzel is quoted saying that he saw Bandit on the news and called up his team and he was like, we need that for Cedar Point. We're not building a mega looper. We're going to build a tall roller coaster with lots of hills in fact, Magnum, originally they wanted to go to the source and build a Togo, but, but it was, it was cost prohibitive yep. because the dollar was, was weak at the time compared to the yen. So and then there was Arrow. also the shipping problem and the, the shipping costs. And and yeah. It was a lot easier to work with American projects. I mean, the stand-up coasters that were built at that point were very, very expensive. The King's Entertainment Corporation stand-ups, King Cobra, Shockwave, Skyrider, those were very pricey additions because Togo had... had the goods. They had the the Astro Comet, the world's first mass produced stand up coaster ride system, um, which you can still enjoy in places other than the United States. Also at Yomiuri Land. Yomiuri the Land. Manga. <laughs> so this coaster is out of control. You've probably seen it because it, it's made around over the social media channels over the last 10 years, but it is an originally sit down looping coaster mm-hmm. with a loop that um, circumnavigates the lift hills, yeah. you know, you know, yeah. like Riddler. Yep. However, after a couple of years, they decided they could remarket the attraction as a stand-up mm-hmm. coaster by building an additional train, and that train was a stand-up train. Now, it reminds you of the clearances, the clearances for this roller coaster were designed for a sit-down coaster. <laughs> and now we are standing up in this Yankee, Janky, whatever you call it, mm-hmm. Togo stand-up coaster. I literally was so effing scared. It was really scary going through that layout and like the clearances just didn't seem lined up. I was like inches away yeah. from my head from the track yeah. as we go through the loop. It was really, really the scary. The stand-up coaster for Togo was an instant success because their very first clients with the Astro Comet, with the stand-up coaster, were parks that already had a looping coaster. And they said, this is the same chassis. You can put a stand-up train on your looping coaster and market it as a new ride. 
totally ahead of the game. The first several Togo stand-ups were built as looping coasters. It wasn't until the mid-'80s, the the first stand-up trains were built in the early 80s for existing coasters. Not until the mid-'80s did we see custom stand-up coasters built in Japan. In fact, the first custom stand-up coaster from the ground up built was the King Cobra at King's Island. And to this day, it still leaves a legacy. There's clones of the, of the King Cobra ride layout that are still in operation in Japan and um, also uh, other different ride layouts using the stand-up train. Um, but but yeah. I think if you're going to talk about most notable Togo coaster, it is going to be Fujiyama. Fujiyama. Um, when you tell me that My there favorite is hyper-coaster. a 1996 build, still a hypercoaster of 260 feet tall, that is made by Togo. My first, prior to writing it, my first reaction would have been like, well, that sounds like it's going to suck, right? Because that's kind of just the way people have talked about Togo for years. Yeah. But um, I will say that Fujiyama is one of the very best hypercoasters ever built. It has balls. It has airtime. The audacity. And those things ride. where I'm like, why are you diving 100 foot into a freaking dirt turn? And then there's like zigzag can, airtime yeah. hills. And this ride is out of control, but it's so good. Early generation so hypercoasters are so special because even though Magnum was credited as the first hypercoaster and laid the groundwork for the hypercoaster formula, it wasn't until the late 90s where hypercoasters started to get a bit more streamlined. Earlier hypercoasters, Following immediately following Magnum include Desperado, Pepsi Max Big One, and Fujiyama, none of which operate in the same out-and-back formula as Magnum, and they're all the better for it. Fujiyama is real cool in that sense because um, <laughs> I guess it's almost very Japanese to have big F and turns yeah. and big hills. It's just a giant so, jet coaster with big The amount of superstructure that was required to build some of these turnarounds and some of the some of the lift hill structure out of this world. Incredibly really expensive unique. too. Because, you know, keeping everything up to code in Japan as per earthquake regulations, it was an audacious over the top power move ride. And in some ways, it was really ahead of its time. We're looking at pictures of it right now. It has that sloped brake run into the station. Togo was doing sloped brake runs on their hyper coasters in 1996. And then it has this. We didn't start dive. seeing that stuff in the U.S. until like all the way to the ground, a decade into later. A giant turn. Yeah, right before I mean, the is... right before the airtime finale, where it just dives into the floor and into a 90 degree. I, it's, I can't say enough about this ride. Like it really. That was the biggest surprise I think of the trip because it was we so were. No, we went to Fuji Q for. Long. Dodonpa. Yeah. We went to Fuji Q for Ishinaika. Ishinaika. We went to you know, Takabisha and we kind of were going to get right to Fujiyama because yeah. it was there. But that turned out to be like the star. I mean, we Ishinaika is really cool. Because we couldn't. Yeah. But there's that Anaconda, like a yeah. country over as yeah. far. Ish, um, the Fujiyama, there's nothing like it. It is such a unique, smooth, unique take it on, on a hyper. It feels so classic, yet it feels like an ultra modern new design every I time mean, you ride it. I can it. still remember when Fujiyama opened because. Desperado and Pepsi Max Big One, respectively, had the height record, um, which they took from the Steel Phantom. They had it for two years, and then Fujiyama opened and broke the height record um, for just the tallest roller coaster in the world, period, and remained the tallest full-circuit coaster in the world um, right up until the opening of Goliath at Magic Mountain and then Millennium Force a month later. And if you want a little fun fact, uh, Fujiyama actually means king of coasters, king, slash king of, of mountains, coasters, king of mountains, um, because Fuji is king and Yama is mountain. And roller coasters <laughs> are themed to Russian mountains, so that's yeah. what the name usually comes from in most languages. So uh, it could be interpreted as either. But either way, phenomenal ride, and yeah. that's what you got to think about when you think about Togo. They've got some of the best stuff. Um, there's even more rides that. We can go on forever. Sir Coaster Leviathan you know, closing this year is also a huge mosquito bite on my ass because that was a great Togo. We got a lot of mosquito bites on your ass this that year. That was a great ride. <laughs> <laughs> uh, anyway. So now we'll go back to uh, it's another you know beloved Western manufacturer. Now we're going to... Where we? Oh, yep. We're going to Germany. So um, over to Europa Park, I guess. <laughs> sort of. Okay. The most beautiful thing about Europa Park is like because it's a showcase for Mac, it's like... They're not really worried about how much profit the park makes. Obviously, it's a business and they want to profit on it. But at the end of the day, their primary operative for that park is to make sure that their potential clients and guests have a good time. See, Mac is a funny manufacturer because I don't necessarily think of Mac as like, wow, pushing the limit to like, wow, this is a revolutionary company. But I do think about Mac 
when I think about quality and I think about niche. Mm-hmm. And they have carved this niche for being like the water coaster manufacturer of the world. Yeah. And we've written some of their best stuff, like in Chamlong Ocean Kingdom in South China. They we have two Mac water coasters. We rode um, Walrus Splash, which is a souped up larger version of, of the a Super, Super Splash. Splash with like an underwater tunnel and mm-hmm. um, some extra scenery and themes. And, and then Polar Explorer, which, which is, is an extended, extended version extended of standard water coaster. Water coaster, yeah, exactly. Um, and those are just good, good rides. Like I really always generally enjoy their water coasters that I really think of like, if I don't think of a water coaster, I think of Mac yeah. first thing. That's how Mac, I think, really broke into the U.S. market. Prior to Journey to Atlantis in Orlando, they were famous. They did their bobsleds. And wild Mouse. King's Dominion had a bobsled. The Wild Mice were, you know, getting popular. But I people had tried and failed many times to crack the code on a water coaster. And Mac just did it like they killed it that was the very first one that was the prototype mac water coaster right here in orlando then they built a bigger one that was more coastery for uh for europa park poseidon um which polar explorer is based on that poseidon layout it has the two different like roller coaster sequences separated by two sets of yeah except for floating. the station is so far removed from the actual coaster section yeah. if you coast underneath part of the area and then you go through a bear exhibit and then you eventually actually up on the coaster part but Either way, those are really, I think, where Mech shines the most. Mech is good at a production model game, obviously, yeah. because they've got those Blue Fire clones popping up Blue everywhere. Blue Fire is, like, an unmistakable icon in the launch coaster world because I don't think we will ever see a launch coaster of that size. Really, I don't think we'll see any coaster of that size cloned quite to the same And now they're offering a special that kind one. that is being built at DreamWorld Australia. The swing launch. Where it'll be a swing launch, kind of like Star Trek's beginning, um, but on... Star Trek Operation Enterprise at Movie Park Germany. Which I want to give a shout-out yeah. to because I love that ride. Love and I that think ride. it is yep. a really fun Mac project that kind of shows that <laughs> Mac really is a lot more diverse than I think I usually give it credit to. And I, but I think the biggest showcase of that is their most notable attraction, mm-hmm. For me, it's Lost Gravity. Yeah. Um, I can't believe this Big Dippers haven't been sold Lost more. Gravity is intense. You know, people pigeonhole Mac for being, like, more reliable but less intense than, like, Intamin's Which I would say for the launch coasters, it generally is the case. Like, yeah. Intamin's will F me up, but Macs yeah. are a lot more pleasant. Macs are, the lo- yeah, the rate of acceleration isn't anything to sneak, you know, to write home about. But they build a consistent product. They were, I think they were ahead of Intamin at the time when it came to the the, the energy efficient launch coasters that uh, didn't have any moving parts as far as their launch mechanisms went because when Blue Fire was being developed, I mean Intamin was still using flywheels for everything. And we also have to give Mac a little bit of um, <coughs> respect for the fact that they created a product line that could be adapted to any audience. So mm-hmm. you can build a Blue Fire clone that has a freaking swing launch. Or you can build Manta at SeaWorld San Diego mm-hmm. and have the exact same trains, exact same ride operating system. Or you can, but build, really, or you can build Helix. Or you can build Helix. So <laughs> it's such an incredibly diverse... And leave people breathless with an unrelated mix of launches Or you can build Star Trek, where like you have moving set, yeah. track pieces. So there's yeah. so much that you can do with with that Mac product that even though it may not always be like the most notable when it comes to like speed and acceleration rates, um, it is a perfect product for the industry. And I just need to see more m- yeah. big big dippers because uh, Lost Gravity. I need a Mac Big Dipper in the U.S. It's phenomenal. Like yesterday, like I need my Eurofighters to take a break. Love you, yeah. Goose but I need my Eurofighters to take a break. Yeah, and I need some some I Mac, need a big, Mac Big Dipper because I think that they kind of at one point the Gerslauer coaster started running together to Eurofighters. Yeah, but I think that Mac just brought this whole new fresh. Kind of like angle a to Mac this, right? A Mac Dipper is like a Skyrush Eurofighter. Yeah, because you're like, wow, they've done like everything that came with a Eurofighter. It's so compact and there's not a Helix. But then like Mac's like, whoa, 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 hold my beer. Yeah. Hold my whatever that great for beer is. Yeah. I'm going to go. Hold my Hefenweiser. Yeah. I'll, <laughs> hold my Kohlsteiner. Yeah. I'm going to, oh no, sorry, that's sparkling water. Doesn't matter. <laughs> hold my whatever I'm drinking in Germany and I'm going to go and build a super intense, compact roller coaster with different seating configurations. I feel like they just completely rewrote the book on what a compact looper can be, and I'm such an incredibly big fan. I need, I really need more of these. Oh, and a time traveler. 
Oh, and then there's, of course, Time Traveler. We have to talk, because Time Traveler was a highlight of our year. Oh, Time Traveler was dope. And then now they're getting another Time Traveler in Belgium, mm-hmm. which word has it that one of the trains that was made for Sodal City is going to Plopsaland, which mm-hmm. is why Plopsaland in Belgium has the exact same name for the coaster, because time the Traveler. trains are themed to Time, time Traveler. Traveler Belgium edition. Which will also have a vertical drop. It'll have... Um, it's a banana roll. Yeah, like it has like a top hat, I can't believe and then thing. like a ninety degree turn, and then like a a pre drop thing where like it holds the train kind of, and and then lets you go. The Belgium coast of Warsaw right now, guys. Yeah. Like Mac is definitely a place yeah. to be. Yeah. So um, <laughs> Mac and Intamin are both going toe to toe. I feel Belgium like there's yeah right the now. major players right now. There's so much to talk about. Um, again, we'll we'll do a whole series on that maybe a little yeah. later this year when we yeah, have some Mac more development. But. Is another company where as Europa Park has proven, you could build a, a you could furnish an entire theme park with just Mac rides. Yep. Obviously, not everything at Europa Park is Mac, but everything that Europa Park has, Mac could build. Yeah. So Mac gets me my um, my wooden coasters. Yeah. Not yet. Um, <laughs> speaking of um, of other notable theme park and these we're gonna go to our first deceased i guess mesho may have been deceased um, yeah mesho and togo are both toast but american legacy designers that are no longer with us we're gonna talk about a Giovanola first yeah. oh we're gonna talk about Giov- okay yeah because i think it's a funny one like okay that is a, okay so history lesson Giovanola is the, was the subcontractor Giovanola is responsible yeah. for the boxy wide track, the four across seating, that was Giovanola. Yeah, so when Intamin came out with air stand ups, um, well, Giovanola was. Z-Force. was 1985 oh, was right. the very yeah, first. Z-Force. Yeah. So he's very first four those. cross. Yeah. And then Intamin started doing stand up coasters because thanks to Togo, that was the flavor of the month. That was what people were interested in. So Intamin, as soon as Togo started getting global success with the stand up coaster, Intamin's like, well, we have this new track system. Like, we're going to build stand-up coasters with this because that's what, what people are crazy about. And then Bulgar and Maviard, which butted off of Intamin's use of Giovanola's track system, kind of took over that whole component. Yes, yeah, so Giovanola was part of the company, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. Um, prior to becoming a subcontractor to some projects from B&M. So B&M split off and then Giovanola yeah. split off. And it became a subcontractor to, to the old b and products, especially the stand-ups. Mm-hmm. And NGF Nola was like, we're going to go and make our own coasters, which, for better or for worse, they got some of the best coasters in the world. In 1999, last, they launched their very first totally self-designed coaster, Anaconda, Gold Reef City, which, according to people that we know who've ridden this ride, they say it's the best inverted coaster in the world it looks down. spectacular. It it's looks not like sick. a Batman clone on steroids. It's sharp, like really long narrow. Trains. Batman clone with 10 car trains, double cork at the end. And then they have... Which, and then they built Goliath. I know we like to hate on Goliath <laughs> and Titan, but and Goliath Titan? and Titan were early in the game. Yeah. They were there before B&M had attempted the whole, the whole hyper thing. Quite to like the... Ex- well, quite I mean, to the it's height, kind of I guess. Like the same t- but yeah, I mean, I was never the biggest fan of Goliath or Titan, but I appreciate them more now. Yeah, I Goliath think that they... Goliath and Titan are more like on the Fujiyama... Yeah, side of of ride. Totally, we like to, we like <laughs> to look at we like to look at hyper coasters. Uh, Baby and M and Intamin is like the guides to the industry. But we're gonna realize that when like the first B and Ms were being built, um, one of which Raging Bull is very much like a Giovanola. Yeah, um, and then you had the Terrain Hyper, but these are all being designed at the same time, so yeah. they all kind of went a different route. Do Giovanola's route didn't last because they died, but. I do want to give them credit for like having their own kind of idea of what a hybrid coaster could be. I still don't quite understand why they went. On. I, I I blame Six Flags. I'm guessing that they went bankrupt or something related to Six Flags defaulting. But I will say the Titan is awesome. That they built. But yeah, the helices. It's kind of yeah. like a Fujiyama, you know, box yeah. track kind of idea. And um, so the I more, do want to give them. The more I like that them. I ride B and M hyper coasters and the new ones being built or. You know, the what, the more I just ride standard hyper coasters and straightforward hyper coasters, the more I appreciate a ride like Goliath or Titan. I mean, Goliath's twenty years old this year. It's pretty crazy, but yeah. So shout out to Gia Vanoa. <laughs> well, they lost it. Yeah. And uh, next up, we have PTC no longer around. Um, well, PTC of course still builds roller coaster rolling stock. True, I should have rewarded but that. They do not have PTC is like actual coaster building yes. department and designing. Yes, they do not the have a coaster thing. designing department. They started their their lead designer for PTC was Herbert Schmeck, uh, way back in the day. We're talking like late thirties into the fifties, 
first Herbert Schmeck and then um, John Allen. And so between these guys, I mean, Herbert Schmeck's existing, like the remaining Herbert Schmeck wooden coasters are pretty iconic. You've got the Phoenix, which, you know, just despite being a 70, 80 year old ride, you know, is, was voted the best wooden coaster by Golden Ticket Awards, which you need to take the Golden Ticket Awards with a grain of salt. But, you know, that ride was hovering around in the top 10 for its whole life. And... Thanks in no small part to Kenny Wood's dedicate or Kenny Wood Knobel's dedication. Well, Kenny Wood's dedicated too. We'll talk about Kenny Wood in a little bit when we talk about our uh, John Miller coasters. Anyway, the Phoenix is awesome. Knobel uh, does a great job of maintaining it, but at the end of the day, man, that was a Herbert Schmeck design that withstood the test of time. Comet at Hershey Park is fantastic. The Comet at Waldemere is adorable. We just rode that one. There's a few others. I think the late the the Yankee Cannonball, if I'm not mistaken. Let me pull up my little notes here. Where's Herbert Schmeck? DC Schmeck. Yeah, Yankee Cannonball uh, at at Canopy Lake is awesome. Well, Herbert Paul Schmeck is credited to have designed um, 72 roller coasters. He was very prolific. Was pretty revolutionary. Oh, oh, down to the 20s. So he was he was designing coasters in the era of, of John Miller. And, a very important era, kind yeah. of the start of the whole industry. When mm-hmm. it came to roller coasters, I mean, without these pioneers, we wouldn't have been there. And that's yeah. one of the reasons we, we were mentioning them, because we can talk about coasters who have been closed since the freaking 50s. But at the same time, again, mm-hmm. this is the start of the whole industry that we all love and the reason you're listening to a podcast. Um, wooden coasters are an American original when it comes to, like, the modern, you know, the modern roller coaster, the modern theme park. Um, so it's important that we give kind of a shout out to that in this episode as well. And then following the, the Herbert, Herbert Schmeck's retirement, his, he passed the torch to John Allen, who is responsible for a lot of well-loved um, wooden coasters of the, of the regional park boom. Um, his self-proclaimed magna opus, the Screaming Eagle, is definitely still our favorite of, of his designs. I mean, we rode Screaming Eagle a couple years ago. Um, during the Halloween event at Six Flags St. Louis, it was bitter no, cold. No coaster. Bitter so cold, good. but that thing ran like a beast. It was so, so, so fantastic. Some um, of my favorite wooden coasters. Great American Scream Machine is a great ride. That ride's no slouch. Do we have? We should pull up the. Uh, John Allen built so many. I mean, PTC really was it. Like if you were yeah, building, John a, Allen has twenty six. to build designs, a wooden coaster, but yeah, the, a lot time. more of the modern ones like Screaming Eagle, Racer yeah. seventy five. Mr. Yeah. Twister. All of the uh, Taft Kitty Coasters. Blue Streak at Cedar Point. Um, you know, we're going to talk about those kind of rides like Swamp Fox at Family oh, yeah. Kingdom Amusement Park. You know what I think is a grossly underrated John Allen experience is the um, the Cannonball at Lake Winnipesaukee, which if you're a fan of the Blue Streak at Cedar Point, I consider the Cannonball to be the Blue Streak's like fraternal twin. Cannonball is the Blue Streak the way it was intended. A great out-and-back coaster, beautifully maintained with the original um, PTC buzz bar trains. I mean, that ride is just beautiful. Buzz bar trains, I don't think it has seatbelts. I mean, I think it's just running trains to the same configuration that it had when it opened in 1968, I believe. Fantastic ride. A a true classic little coaster, the pride of, of Chattanooga. The Georgia side of Chattanooga. The pride of Chattanooga. <laughs> <laughs> I know it's not saying much, but... <laughs> no, no, I just love it, though. It's a fantastic it Sounds like ride. it's kind of tied to I would slap on a coaster, you know, yeah. like back in the... Whatever, you I know. would. You know, you the go to Chattanooga, Chattanooga for two things. Yeah. The Chattanooga Choo Choo and the Lake Winnipesaukee Cannonball. I've decided. You've decided. Um, I guess came for the river to drive by, yeah. but yeah, okay. We'll talk more about... We're going to talk... After, in the in the grand timeline of wooden coasters, PTC makes up a huge chunk in the middle there of like everything from Roaring Twenties wooden coaster, um, omnipresence, you know, bump, you know, sh- bumping shoulders with Frank Pryor, Frederick Church, and um, John Miller to the regional park boom. By the time Screaming Eagle was built, um, John Allen died shortly thereafter, and his Protégé, um, Bill Cobb, took over. Um, Roller Coaster Database isn't explicit about PTC's role in future projects thereafter. We just knew that, like, John Allen, with John Allen, came 
the the PTC branch of Wooden Coaster Design, and it, and he took that with him to his grave, if I'm not mistaken. Although, of course, PTC trains are still being manufactured for for roller coasters to this day. Um, but now I'll move on to um, but now to another see. classic looking manufacturer. It's still around. <laughs> I absolutely adore Adora. these people. Yes. I don't ever hear this podcast. I'm pretty sure based on the booth that I have. We went to their booth that I have. It was so cute. It was the cutest booth. It was, it was so like cute. stepping back in time, being like, "Oh yeah, of course, Myler has pictures. Myler. Yes, a single laptop and like a catalog on the table. It was just like the. It was literally so precious. It was amazing, and it was like it's family run, right? Like yeah. it's, it's a Myler family. Myler, like, yes, and Myler and Associates is no slouch. They had an extremely humble booth at IAPA. Um, but they are, they are incredibly important, especially in the U.S. theme park market. Yep. If it's a kitty coaster, it's likely a miler, yeah. especially if it's older than five years. Yep. Um, if, if it's an American-built kitty coaster that is newer than the 1960s, it is likely a built in the last any American manufactured kitty coaster in the last sixty years is a really good chance. And I freaking love these things. We, do, we always ride them. They're no, so I know we're cute. kind of like ferreting around, but I always generally enjoy my rides on them. They are whippy. They are intense. They are full of character from the moment they're built. Um, and I, I think we can speak for most Southern Californians that like we greatly miss the Scandia Screamer. Yeah, that was actually our number one on our list for most notable. For this they manufacturer. Were, they had a foot in the door with building a giant, major regional-sized, nearly hyper-style roller that coaster. That thing was huge. That was, it was bonkers. It was one of our favorite rides in SoCal. That was a cool, cool ride. And it's, it's being sold. It's in, last we heard at IAPA, it was being sold to a certain somewhere hmm. that we can't talk about. I thought they were in the progress of like helping with selling and trying to get it up oh, again, I thought they but were, it wasn't I thought guaranteed. It was on a contract, wasn't no, it? Okay. no, they were I really mean, trying to get it yeah. sold because it's one of the biggest things they ever did. Yeah, um, it'll it'll show up somewhere. Mylers never really die. I mean, they just. I mean, and they're still not dying because um, some of their newer projects, like in New Jersey, um, it is called Wild Waves. I'm not yes, mistaken. Wild Waves at Playland Castaway Cove, which is a is a double circle. Roller coaster custom layout using that circle the navigates the SNS Gill Force. Yeah, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. I mean, this thing is just classic Miler. You know, just to look at it. Um, and the trains that are the same. The There's trains the are the same that they've been using since. Uh, love it. The Hurricane at um, Fun Spot, Fun Spot in America in Kissimmee. Kissimmee is a great new addition. We wrote that on Christmas Eve last when year. When it opened, yeah, yeah. It's new for new for Christmas, Christmas 2019. Yeah. <laughs> 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 really um, and then, I mean, there's just good ones all around. Um, obviously, Scandia, Ontario is no longer with us, but um, Scandia, Sacramento has... Uh, the Great Dane uh, Coaster. The Great Dane Coaster, which, which like Scandia Screamer, was a one-of-a-kind. Great Dane Coaster once operated at Casino Pier in New Jersey. It was sold. Um, I'm trying to find, find it. On, I'm like literally on their list. I don't, go to... Go I, to uh, I think they renamed it. Go to Casino Pier. Because it'll be in there from when they sold it. Which would be 11. It's a, uh, oh, there's a million wild mouses here. The one from 1999. You see the mouse? wild mouse from 1999? That is the Myler mouse. It was sold in 2012. Scandia bought it. Oh, it's g- crazy dang Crazy coaster. dang coaster. Not great dang coaster. Okay, this thing is really fun. I love this the ride. The trains are actually kind of comfortable. We've ridden it multiple times. Yeah, we actually have made several trips to these. Yeah. So yeah, believe it or not, we're actually like big miler connoisseurs. We're only missing like one big miler, which is that's wild the, the wild waves because it's pretty new. But yeah. we have like Soaring Eagle at Fun Spot Atlanta. Boom! Super love that good. ride. Great selfie. Great little that. coaster. Um, <laughs> but yeah, we have like the majority of the big milers, which is funny because I guess now make that realization that we have like all the cool milers yeah. and we've written them. So uh, uh, shout out is to milers, a grossly underrated American institution. I hope those really guys. Good. I hope we, I hope you guys hear this. I hope those guys that we talk to. Yeah, and if you know these people, podcast, because I have no way of reaching out to them. Because, um, <laughs> tell them that we love you know, their coasters and that um, we really, really adore yeah, everything about them. The Myler team, like let them know. And like, yeah, I've definitely been beat up <laughs> by their coasters, but like in a good way, you know. Yeah. Like Intimus beat me up in a lot. Yeah. So, um, yes, we, that's we a would, really fun. We would love to see. We think like we love that uh, fun spot. America Parks, for example, is. Very miler oriented. They have five milers between their three parks, and I would hope, I would love nothing more than to see Scandia Screamer resurface uh, Fun Spot Orlando because they need 
another miler, in my opinion. My oh, humble totally. opinion. Um, and then next, yeah. we're going to talk about everyone's legacy favorite. <laughs> the, the one the and all. And I mean, all. speaking of big American institutions yeah. and roller coaster manufacturers. The most iconic American We both have tattoos of them. Um, by now you know. I have, yeah. It's Arrow. It's Aerodynamics. It's Aerodynamics. This is another one that we'll, we'll, we'll need a full episode for. <laughs> yeah, like at this <laughs> so one... But the good news is that everyone's heard about us talking about Arrow for years yeah. now, and like, we're like, we could launch Arrow an nerds. entire podcast series just on Arrow Dynamics. So like, we can quickly list some of the best looking Arrows in the world that someone has written, um, including Fantasia Special, Viper Vegemite, Ninja, Eagle's Fortress is no longer around. Um, we have Titan V, Titan Space v. World. We have Dragon uh, at Ocean Park. That's which, our favorite Arrow favorite Looper. Favorite Arrow Coaster. Oh, Even Arrow though. Looper? Well, I well, mean, it's definitely your favorite arrow looper, but maybe favorite I think our arrow. favorite arrow coaster might be X two, like, or is it? I mean, or is it Desperado? Well, well here's like, my thing with X two is like, well, there's better versions, better of versions two of, of them, X2. and X two runs an SNS yeah. train. Yeah. However, which we'll get to SNS in a little bit, uh, we do have Dragon, which is by far the most like, from traditional loopers, Dragon the most is spectacular, so one. wonderfully strange. That ride, not Dragon Mountain, by the way. It's just Dragon yeah. Ocean Park, Hong Kong. But Dragon Mountain is lit. Dragon Mountain's really cool too. Too bad the park sucks. Yeah, we don't Real really want to talk about that place too uh, much. Yeah, anyway, I feel like it keeps coming. Up. Yeah, well, I mean, <laughs> that coaster's good as hell. That bow tie though. That bow tie is dope. <laughs> But I mean, is it as dope as a dirt turn several like a <laughs> hundred, if not a thousand feet over the ocean? Dragon is so like, dragon ridiculous. Is... Ah! If you picture like <laughs> the first three inversions of Viper at Magic Mountain, except sitting on the edge of a cliff, looking out over the South China Sea, and the third vertical loop is a sidewinder. The first sidewinder, actually. It is just a perfect storm. It's like, oh, is this a mine train? <laughs> oh no no! It's a mine train with loops. It's just so oh no no no! Wait wait! This is like an arrow looper, and then I mean like it's like mega looper just over the ocean. Wonderful and strange. That was part of the very short-lived arrow hus. Uh, yeah, the whole park was like arrow yeah, hus though because that, they had the condor. That whole and stuff park too. was hus and arrow and arrow and condor. Hus. Yeah, rest in peace. It's so funny because we came to that park and it was my first visit. Alex had been before, but when Alex went, hair razor was open, but you know to be him. But Dragon was close. Yeah. So it was like a head to go on Dragon. Uh, I like head to go on Dragon yeah. too because, you know, we love our arrows. Someday I'll go to Ocean Park and both coasters will be open. But so far it's but only like, been But like I did not get crap that Hair Razor hair was razor close. Was close Dragon because Dragon is of, so of good. Because typhoon damage. Yeah, the this is like literally the day after Typhoon, by the way. And even my cousin Caitlin, who, who lives in Hong Kong, she loves roller coasters. Um, even she agreed that she preferred Dragon over Hair Razor because it was more quirky. Not going to lie though. When we talk about the fact that it was just Typhoon, we were like on one of the first flights out yeah. between Tokyo and Hong Kong after the Typhoon. Was, and we literally got to the park that same day. Typhoon debris and everywhere. And we weren't even sure we were allowed to be there because there were missing <laughs> cars we on the Ferris the wheel. Open. <laughs> there was like tree shrapnel everywhere and we were like had to remove a piece of tree to get yeah. to the roller coaster. We were very grateful. Totally worth it though. For it was that so day. awesome. That was, was my so 900th awesome. coaster. That but yeah, that's why Hair Race was down. Like it was yeah. damaged by the Typhoon. Yeah. We'll ride here. I mean, I would. Okay. It wasn't. I like to think to that we'll go back to that park and uh, Dragon. Dragon will still be open, uh, unlike Desperado, which we've oh, been Desperado. riding. Magnum. See, we love Desperado. We've been riding Magnum a lot lately because we've been doing. We've done multiple trips to Cedar Point just in the last couple of months, and like Magnum is still the bee's knees. Like that's by far my favorite asset uh, in Ohio anymore. Um, I like. My Maverick, but well, yeah, you know, I mean, but, I, but obviously, it's sucker for my arrows and Magnum yeah. is close. But for me, it always comes down to like, well, Magnum is really cool and transcending, but but then there's it Desperado. isn't Desperado, and I feel like some of our friends love Magnum to death to the point where I'm like, okay, I love Magnum, Magnum, but again, it's not Desperado. It was, yeah, they built a better coaster, and Desperado is insane, and I'm so sad. That it's living the, in the desert, dying, is, is, if it's ever yeah. going to open up again. But I'm glad to have made at least it five ran, visits it to it ran ride as in. recently as 2019. Um, but yeah, you went a couple times before we met. And, and then, then we went then like three times twice, together. No, three at times. Least twice. We went October, January, We got nighttime and July, rides, daytime so rides. we've been a lot united That log together. flume, classic arrow log flume, super lit, gone, toast, <sighs> yeah. fini, finito. But yeah, I really think that um, one of Arrow's strongest coasters is the Sprato. It's massive. It is all over the place. It has amazing views. It is violent. Like, I keep thinking I'm going to fly like out and end about, up and, like, die in the desert. Like we brought up with um, 
with Fujiyama, that ride was all the better for not yet experiencing the, uh, I, I guess, all the better for not representing the the hyper coaster formula that we would later um, become accustomed to with like B and M and Morgan hyper coasters. Uh, that ride is just insane, and I don't think it's long for this world. So we're we're gonna pour one out for Desperado someday. It's just gonna it's just gonna I'm disintegrate. Gonna pour an entire bottle of wine out for Desperado. It will disintegrate into the desert. It'll be a mirage one day. I will never evaporate. It's it's a good thing we don't live in L A anymore because we used to go to Vegas all the time and, and driving we drive by. It. That ride, and like closed. the drive from Valencia, you know, my demand area, is just to Vegas was awesome. But like the highlight was always seeing Desperado yeah. or riding it if it was open. Yeah. Um. So that's you know it's our thing. We'll just fly it out. Of that's city, all right. right. We'll always have Matterhorn bobsleds. True, true. Matterhorn bobsleds <laughs> deserves a fair <laughs> shout out. Yeah. I mean, again, Arrow has so many great products. We'll have a whole Arrow it's, episode. It, it, yeah. We talk about how uh, like a company like Intamin or Mac could very easily furnish a whole theme park and. Aerodynamics furnished Disneyland. There wasn't much there wasn't from, from Disneyland's early years that wasn't Aero. I mean, Aerodynamics started out as a carousel company. I mean, flumes, carousels, um, car, rides, car rides, Autopia, Gap, dark little, rides, antique and rides, and dark ride track systems. They did it all. They did everything. So Aero is awesome, and we will also have a whole episode on that, and, and sometime this season, maybe next season. Yeah. Um, next up, Where are we, we are actually going to go Where ahead and talk about some of the um, wooden manufacturers. We'll do some wooden coasters. Yeah, so we'll start with uh, CCI. What are CCI? Okay. So Alex is Mr. Wooden <laughs> Coaster in the family. <laughs> the little background here is that um, I, when, I, no, when I was a kid, I had like two wooden coasters like within the five-hour drive from me, um, which was Bandit, Bandit. And then when they eventually built Robin Hood and I guess also Vampire. Oh, no. Um, not Vampire. Werewolf. 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 Um, so I'm not really, you know, European kids I mean, like me how weren't far really is raised. Paris from Insulade? Is that because Tonnerre de Zeus was? It's five hours. There. Yeah, Tonnerre de Zeus is almost the same age as you. Anyways, <laughs> Europe had didn't have jack shit for wooden roller coasters till you know the U.S. company started yeah. coming in. So when Six Flags rolled up on in there and they bought, um, you know, they started operating Mo- Warner Bros. Movie World, mm-hmm. the Wallaby, then Six Flags Holland, Six Flags Belgian Parks, yeah. and Warner Brothers in Madrid. That's when Wooden Coasters came to the, yeah. to Europe, but that wasn't until like the American companies were like putting them in. Yeah. And now it's like, well, GCI galore now, all over Europe. Yeah. There's awesome coasters there. However, my background has always been steel coasters. I was raised yeah. on like old steel coasters. Yeah. And so Alex always talked about all the Woodies, and he's a Woody nerd. We didn't talk you know? about Cop Car Chase during our Intamin bit, but I like the, I like the block is that out of my memory. That is well, uh, Cop Car Chase slash Lethal Weapon Pursuit. The dueling Intamin Looper was like the feather in his cap because that was his like childhood favorite. I, mean, I will I will say that <laughs> Star Trek is the first. Well, Finn Helsing was cool too, but Star Trek was the first time to really kind of yeah. brought back that sort of energy yeah. for me. Um, oh, we're talking about Help Van Helsing, too. We'll talk about it a little yeah. bit. But anyway, CCI, babe, so, tell me. Custom tell me, Coasters me. International was very significant because up to that point, it was kind of inconsistent as far as wooden coaster fulfillment. Uh, the, like, Din Summer's dynamic duo of coaster design, you know, kind of crashed and burned with the the late 80s and early 90s wood coaster wars. We'll talk more about. We're actually, I think we're gonna, we're talking about those guys. We're going to talk about the Din Summers dynasty as well as um, some of like the more RCCA. like vintage wood coasters oh, <laughs> and RCCA. We're going to talk about that. Those are those will be the wooden coaster contributions in our follow up to this. Um, but the uh, CCI Denise Din, the 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 phoenix of of Din Summers, I think was the first truly consistent. Purveyor of what are you looking at? Cheetah, Wild Adventures. I just love seeing him some rides. I love realize. Wild Adventures. Can you know, coaster. Was that the first CCI? Yes, yeah, CCI's first coaster was Sky Princess. Sky Princess. It will always. Be- I'm so sorry, but whoever Sky decided Princess. to change Sky Princess to like Kingdom Coaster, I don't really like you that much. Yeah. No kidding. I, I don't know who you are, but either way, Sky Prince is a way cooler Sky name. Princess and I would need someone to build a hyper. Sounds like Sky the Princess. gayest thing on earth. No, it just and sounds I majestic. Just but well, also, it's like the queen of the sky. It's not mutually exclusive. It's a seven forty-seven. Like, like I want the queen of the coasters. I'm pretty sure know, Regina at Tobo Zoo is also gay as hell. Babe, she's dead. That's my okay. canon. That's my head canon. Anyway, CZI. 
CCI. If you need had, like a picture of CCI, we have Boss. Um, <laughs> had, uh, CCI had a really prolific Hosher career. Hurricane. Hoosier. Hoosier. Hoosier Hurricane. I keep forgetting how to say it. <laughs> we, um, <coughs> I, I just feel like CCI, I mean, that was, uh, CCI was very prolific in my childhood. I can remember watching these these modern coasters <coughs> start popping up everywhere and they just had a different approach from like the late eighties wooden coasters. Like the the era of like Mean Streak and Hercules and Texas Giant and the Rattler, like that whole idea of like we have to keep building a taller wooden coaster, otherwise it won't sell. Like that they gave up on that. I think Sky Princess was the flag in the sand. It was like, you know, we're here to build good rides that People of all ages are going to enjoy, and we're not trying to sell you a hypercoaster. We want to sell you a ride that the theme park will be able to comfortably maintain, you know, um, and and something that people will care about just because it looks cool and it's and it's unique. And uh, I mean, like, they got a couple big projects like Shivering Timbers. They did get massive. bigger. They got bigger and bigger. Shivering Timbers is what happens when you do the mega wooden coaster correctly. They took a, they took ten years to to arrive at how a ride of that size, a Texas Giant-sized out-and-back coaster uh, should be approached. But, God, like... I will say I love the consistency in the product for CCI. I feel like they're all such different coasters, but one thing they have the same, they ride almost the exact same. Mm -hmm. Whether you are riding original Ghost Rider, for better or for worse, it really starts stuck at the end, but I'm not sure if I can blame CCI for that or the California dryness. Um, But stuff like... Well, like Indiana Beach, for example, or Holiday World is a, is a testament to, like, if you maintain these rides, and it can be done. These are massive rides. Um, and CCI, just looking at one market, looking at Indiana, it was evident that CCI was consistent from start to finish. They knew exactly what they were doing um, the whole time. They, have been, they were pros from start to finish. And uh, one of my favorite CCIs, I mean, I haven't ridden it in half a decade but god Tonnerre de Zeus blew me away it absolutely blew my mind I couldn't believe that a ride that long it wasn't it's not that tall it's not that big I and mean, it's long and it just hauled ass the whole way I hear mixed things about it I'd heard mixed things about it prior to riding it while I was riding it and after I rode it but it's in my top 20 for wooden coasters Tonnerre de Zeus left such an impression on me um, our recent visit to Indiana Beach was was really eye opening. Hoosier Hurricane was okay. It was our, it wasn't our favorite, but that was CCI's third project, and it was I think their largest step at that point. Man, um, they just kept trending up and up with with Cornball Express and and uh, Lost Coaster Superstition Mountain. Both of those rides are are exceptional, um, and just proved that they every year they were building wooden coasters every year from the time that they open their doors from the time that they closed them. And even during the Six Flags era, during the PTC uh, versus Gershlauer train era, I mean, the boss and... The boss is the only CCI left that's, that runs the, the Gershlauers, and it's no worse for it. That's a good ride. We'll, we'll go back when it's not freezing cold outside. I think they can actually ride the boss with its little plastic Gershlauer trains. But yeah, just an awesome, consistent body of work um and if we're going to talk about consistency and like a coast manufacturer where again i feel like every ride is almost always incredibly unique but i feel like i'm riding the same quality over and over and over it's, it's gci great coasters international great coast international mm-hmm. it's my personal favorite wooden coast manufacturer i love their layouts they're twistery yep. they're modern they have so much character and they are some of the best coasters in their respective parks um we haven't ridden all of them yet, obviously. We're still missing a couple important ones, like Python and Bamboo Forest. Again, on this year's itinerary, not happening. Maybe next year. And you can't talk about CCI without also talking about GCI, because Outlaw at um, Adventureland in Iowa was the prototype GCI concept. I believe Mike Boodley, the lead designer for Great Coasters International, is he was working for CCI, and he left to start GCI um, to build Wildcat, to, right? to, yeah, to build yeah. Wildcat at Hershey Park to to reinvent to to create the the Harry Traver Cyclone Renaissance um, wooden coasters with with individual bench trains that could articulate dramatically, sweeping curve drops, fan turns. I mean, 
Then we're going to talk about some of our favorites. They have awesome racing coasters. Um, our favorite will be Yoga in the Black, Efteling, Low to the Ground, High Action. Pacing is always good in these coasters. There's no pacing issues. Um, we have audio animatronic dragon in the lagoon that shoots water. That works too. Um, and then we have lightning racer. Lightning racer is awesome. But I want to give a shout out to Gold Striker for California listeners. Yeah. Gold Striker is magnificent when it opened. It single handedly for me pulled Great America out of a ditch yeah. because I hated Great America, but that ride really. Gold, it was the start of a new life. Gold for Striker park. was the ride. wooden coaster that Perseverance built. They started that project like in 2007. Cedar Fair. Um, yeah, as, 09, soon as, as, Cedar, yeah, as soon as Cedar yeah. Fair acquired Great America, they were like, we need to get a freaking wooden coaster in here. Like a real one. Sorry, Grizzly. Um, <laughs> Grizzly. <laughs> and that ride took seven years to, <laughs> to get off the ground and get constructed. And, and what? I mean, just close by, we had Roar as Cigarettes Grade, uh, sorry, Cigarettes Discovery Kingdom back in the day, Cigarettes Marine World. Marine World. That was the first to run the, the, the rolling Millennium stock Flyers. that we've all yep. learned to love. I think it's some of the best rolling stock out there. Millennium mm-hmm. Flyers, they're fantastic. I'll never forget it. When I was a little boy living in the Bay Area, I rode Roar the year it opened. And my family, and I mean, we grew up. We love the Giant Dipper. We we grew up riding Morgan trains. Love them or hate them, we're, we were a Morgan train family because we were a Giant Dipper family. So Santa Cruz Giant Dipper, San Diego Giant Dipper, Colossus at Magic Mountain, the Grizzly at Great America. We were used to the plastic Morgan train. Which is very much like unique to your location. And then yeah. we rode, well, yeah, they even call them California style. PTC bought the California style train from Morgan to uh, retire. Oh, got you. Okay. To retire the product line. I no bad blood there. I don't blame them for that. Um, but be that as it may, plus Gerschlauer kind of took over the plastic wooden coaster train market. Anywho, we rode Roar, in it was 1999, and it was my first. It was my first trip to Marine World since they had started building rides. Because first time I went there, it was still Marine World Africa USA. It was just animals. It, they had all the elephants and the tigers, and like that was it. That's what you went there for. And then they got the, the Premier Park's late 90s amusement park care package of a boomerang and a pre-owned SLC. And then, coming off the heels of the success of Six Flags America's Roar, they built another one. And this time, the Gravity, or not the Gravity Group, the, um, the Great Coasters International rolling stock, the Millennium Flyers were ready to roll and... We just thought they were so cool. We were just we were enthusies then. I mean, we were we were California coaster kings. We were California <laughs> coaster enthusiasts. We didn't know much about coasters that weren't in that state. Um, but man, we were just stunned. We we hadn't seen anything like those 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 Millennium Flyers, and I still feel that way when we ride a GCI coaster. I'm still amazed like I was 21 years ago the first time I saw them. You know what? And this is one that's been effectual. I can throw around names all day all long because like I feel like oh and then there's this ride and mm-hmm. oh and then there's freaking this ride and then there's oh and then there's this ride. We but, talked about Ghost Rider earlier. GCI man. What a gorgeous reimagining of an existing ride. I, exactly. Ghost Rider. I want to see more Ghost Rider treatments. So Ghost Rider is one of the three rides that we were discussing earlier today. We're like, we have to mention it in this podcast because Ghost Rider shows that even if the GCI wasn't a GCI, it can still be a phenomenal yep. attraction. GCI yep. took that ride and they turned it into a marvelous reskin of a really good CCI layout to begin with, granted. But yep. either way, it was, it's not like they you know, it's not always a guarantee when another manufacturer comes in and to this pre-existing ride. GCI they did, a good job. did a better job with Ghost Rider than yes. RMC has done with a majority of their Iron Horse coasters. Don't at me. Boom. And then, Sorry. Um, another shout out. We really want to give a shout out to SeaWorld San Antonio. Oh my They gosh. have the United States' best GCI. Yeah. I mean, arguably the best in the world, but it, there are a couple of bigger ones. It's one of, of the best ones, wind but, coasters I've ever ridden. Uh, Texas Stingray is phenomenal. It has all these quirks. We have a whole episode on it. Really, I wasn't ready. From last season. But I was not ready. It has everything you want. <laughs> Sorry, we're looking at our cats and they're <laughs> really cute. They're being really cute. They're, they're on the beanbag together, together. Sleeping and listening to our <laughs> screaming at this microphone. <laughs> Their ears are, are folded back because we're being loud and boisterous. And really sad about Texas Stingray. Texas so, <laughs> motherfucking Stingray. So, like, long story short, great airtime, straight drop, never ending transitions. <laughs> it is one of GCI's finest, finest products with incredible pacing. Ipe Wood. 
And that's crazy the wood. New that's like super lumber. Super amazing. <laughs> that doesn't really deteriorate as the quickly. Super, hum- super human lumber that was used for Ghost Rider. Some of it was used for Invader and Texas Stingray. It's Texas Stingray not having seatbelts in the train. One ratching lap bar. And. <laughs> Okay, we can literally go out for hours on this it's one. It's now the Texas Stingray show. But. And then our favorite, the day, favorite GCI. We released. Oh, no, go ahead, go ahead. Go sorry, ahead. yeah, the other no. day we released an article that I spent, <laughs> that my, I poured my heart into it. I got a lot of good feedback, so I really like it. But it's a couple weeks ago. Uh, we went to Shenzhen. We rode this to phenomenal South, South China, right roller coaster on the over the South China Sea. You've all seen it. You've all died over it. You've all yep. nearly orgasmed, <laughs> orgasmed <laughs> over it. Over it. Wood coaster, night flyer, night flyer is GCI. I want to call it. They even called really? it on yeah. our Instagram post yeah. saying it should have been called night flyer. And we're like, we flyer. know. And we're like, we know. It's been ten years, and we know. In their defense, it's like in People China, they're doing well. It has its own Chinese name, and we don't even know what the Chinese name is because we don't read Mandarin. But I think wood coaster it probably is means English. Coaster. I mean, maybe, but that's even if it's even if it is like. In that environment where people in Shenzhen don't know what a wooden coaster is, like, the best way to market a wooden coaster in a region that doesn't have one is to call it wood coaster. Anyway, that's our, that's our favorite wooden coaster, period. Like, I'm pretty sure that I wouldn't take another wooden coaster over it. Maybe if you asked me on a certain day, I would take Lightning Rod or... Hello, Ron, okay, so I took my Google app right now, oh and I'm translating a picture of the entrance sign, and it is it called is Wooden, wooden roller, roller Coaster. coaster. <laughs> so, yes, it is also in Mandarin, Wood Roller Coaster. Don't ask to pronounce it. It's in English, cool, it actually says Wood Coasters with an S. And it was installed by the Shenzhen Runchong Electric and Mechanical Company, and you do not care. That I don't ride know, took but 18 cool. months to build, because awesome. they took each piece of that ride and pulled it up a mile high. It's literally the entrance to Wood Coaster Shenzhen is a mile on foot from the parking lot. Again, this coaster is like located somewhere in the mountains of an abandoned ghost resort in China. It is. If you follow, us, different if you follow us on Instagram, you've seen this picture because you guys made this one of our most liked pictures ever. It's and like, one of our most stolen our pictures picture, ever. Yeah. That's a whole different story. <laughs> Don't get me into it. <laughs> I guess theft is like the greatest form of flattery. Even though it does say clearly on a disclaimer to give us credit <laughs> if you take it. give us credit. You can take our photos and just, use them. Just, just tell people where you got them. Please. please I'm trying. Okay. We're starving. Anyways. We don't have much money. <laughs> we actually... <laughs> But actually, 2020 wasn't a good year for finances. It's fine. It's maybe it's better it's we didn't fine. go. All right. And now, okay. because we are running out of time, yep. uh, we are going to move on to Zero. Okay. Um, from Bolton. Zero is from Bolton. so underrated. Let me go pull them up. Okay. <laughs> Keep talking. So, I love the Zero Flitzer. As far as production models go, like... That one's pretty sweet. It's such a fun little ride. What, you, what, is, what the hell is that? What are you doing? I'm flitz. You're, you're flitzing? I'm flitzing you're at flitzing. RCDP. Okay. okay cool. um, I'm going to talk about Park Estrix again for a second. Voldecar. Am I pronouncing that I think person? it's Voldecar. I, I need to pull it up. I don't speak guys, French, sure. you guys. That might be news to some of you. I am not fluent <laughs> in French. <laughs> I don't think anyone was wondering. Yeah, I think it's Voldecar. I love Voldecar. that stupid I don't ride. Know, doesn't really I mean... Anymore. I love Zero's track bed and how versatile it is, and you've got everything. It's a Hornet model, though, so it is a model, and there are two of them. One of them is located in Flamberg's uh, Village okay, theme park. So is Hornet a clone clone, or is it, it just it's a, part well, of there's the ride two of model? Anyway, No, no, it's a clone. There's two of them. It's funny how, like, Verbolton is such, like, the odd man out, because it's so different from all the other Zeros, but... It's, yeah, it's a strange Zero with, like, indoor section, it's super intense. Coaster, I like Dark Rail, and that thing. Every, but, like, Zero's one of those companies where they're a workhorse brand, and Zero's got their fingerprints on, like, every theme park in the world. Oh, yeah. But because, I mean, it's easy to forget that they've got, like, 200 roller coasters out there. I think, yeah. There's kitty coasters and family coasters all over. Everything. It's from, one of those matter of fact, it doesn't from, die because yeah. the vast majority of their coasters have been, re, have been relocated. Yeah. So I think they're, uh, like they the, made 185, like, yeah. but they've been located in 226 places. And, and only over the course of the existence, out of the 186 ever built, only... 29 haven't made it to this day, but <laughs> yeah. at 226 locations, it means that yeah. of the 157 that are left, a majority of which are in a second location. Well, not majority, but the a lot Tivoli of them product are. line is so versatile. You've got your figure eights, your double figure eights, your little Tivolis, your big Tivolis. Custom ones like um, Nuts Bear Farms. Jaguar. Jaguar. Orange or Street. Orange Street. At Mall of Love America. That Love that ride. Absolutely phenomenal. Um, there's some really good ones in Great Britain. If you've been to... Um, 
Adventure what's it? Adventure Island? The one that has Rage, the the Euro yeah, Fighter. Fantasy Island. Fan- Wait, is that Fantasy Island? Yeah. No, that's in Skegness. Wait, are you talking about the, the one with the Millennium Coaster? What's the one that has No, no, that's a different uh, park. What's the park that has Rage? You'd think we'd be more oh, prepared. There's, There's just down. so many. Adventure Island. Yeah. Okay. Adventure Island in South End on Sea has like two custom zeros. They're super good rides. Um there's just so many. I mean, it's, it's funny. Yeah, I've I've been raised on a lot of a lot of these. I mean, they were mostly production models, or like, like the you know, zero the force coasters. Like all of the Bush Gardens parks have at least one zero. I kind of forgot how many zeros are wrong because I'm looking at the this list now. And I'm like, oh, I wrote this. Zeros. I wrote this, They're and then everywhere. they have all the new ones. Oh, Impulse at Canovals is super cool. Yep, Impulse Wicked is really cool. Is no slouch. Wicked at Lagoon. I have the family coasters. We love really like Jungle Coaster and uh, Channeling Ocean Kingdom. Oh yeah. That was really fun. That's, yeah, Chinese Ocean Kingdom has two zeros. They were added at the same time. Yep. A tiny, tiny one With and like Penguin, a medium one? sized yeah. family one. Yeah. So, yeah, they're really awesome family coasters. Uh, one of those workhorse brands are manufactured and if that, that wasn't live enough, on forever. Zero does not get enough credit for inventing one of the most successful and omnipresent flat rides ever conceived the Wave Swinger. The Wave Swinger is a portrait of Zero's success. Because, I mean, it debuted in the 70s, and it was all the rage on the German fair circuit. Now, oh, yeah. every manufacturer has their version of the wave swinger. But, but Zero did it first. Zero did it first, and you can still find Zero wave swingers that were built in the 70s. You'll see them the retrofitted. The original ones had the operator booth in the center of the t- of the of the tower. I think even Kings Islands was like an OG one that we they relocated from like Coney Island or something, and then they moved the operator booth out from inside of the ride because it wasn't safe. But... Yeah, Zero is is an OG. Like, it doesn't get enough credit for for its contributions, which is which is why we're doing this podcast, really. Now, should we finish with Gerschlauer or SNS? You tell me, and then we'll start with the other one. Let's do let's do Gerschlauer first. Is that what this says? Yeah, it's Gerschlauer. That does that looks like it looks I like, wrote Gersh looks because like grass. I was because we were <laughs> okay. Not a fun fact. We were. We were, at a sushi bar. we were at a sushi bar early tonight, and we were, like, crafting our episode here on a freaking napkin. I've spent all day compiling on a napkin. my list of so sorry, manufacturers me, on my phone. It's, like, every manufacturer that has custom roller coasters, um, and then talking, you know, and, and, then this, and then we divided them in half so that we could do two episodes. Really glad. Because yeah, because we're... <laughs> this would have been a three-hour podcast if we had You wouldn't have listened to, to the whole yeah. thing. So we're giving you, like, a week or two in between. Okay, so let's talk about Gerschlauer. Because, Gerschlauer like, first? Zero and Mac, it's a German, okay. German engineering... Okay, so first, 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 I want to give a huge shout-out to my old home park. Huge. Huge. Um, <laughs> I don't like Trump that much. Okay, it doesn't matter. <laughs> I want to give a huge shout-out. Huge shout-out. To Tremendous. my German home park of my childhood, Move Park Germany, because they have fun housing. And fun housing is like one of Gerstauer's very Van best Helsing products. Housing Factory is fantastic. They had a movie theater slash dark ride area, and they literally put a roller coaster in there that's one of the best roller coasters. It's a launched wild mouse. It's not like, launched. Yes, it is. Two lift tools. It's fast enough. That second lift hill is a launch. If Mavericks lift, I mean, hill, I'll take it. If Mavericks lift hill is a launch, <laughs> then so is Van Helsing's second hill. Okay, it's a tire driven launch of hill. Got it. It is a launch. It's a launched wild mouse, <laughs> and it has a scare thingy, a hand that pops through the ceiling for the exit, and I like. Pissed no, myself. it's a freaking actual gargoyle thing. Oh, it's, it's like thing. a vampire. It comes out of the ceiling and it like, slides forward. Yeah, it like died. I but the whole ride's so good. I thought like, it was like, theming, shit. Yeah, awesome <laughs> layout, projection mapping, a uh, projection mapping on. Fog screens you can fly mm-hmm. through. Amazing soundtrack. That ride is Gersh part Lauer of the... built this dark ride roller coaster, and they nailed it. And they usually nail it because it's part of their bobsled line, which their very first roller coaster from the ground up in 1998, Saint Tissau, which is at um, Ribnes Park Trips Drill, is a glorified wild mouse, but like true, truly, true glory. Like custom giant wild mouse rides um, that like reinvented the concept and turned little four passenger miniature steel coasters into more than just a variety of hairpin turns uh, folded in inside of itself on a box. Um, 1998, I mean, Gerschlauer like exploded onto the scene because they went from like being non-existent to like having full-size roller coasters built and they were building the wooden coaster trains for uh, CCI and Premier Parks there at that point in time. Gerschlauer, 
God, what do we have here for Gerslauer? Oh, yeah, yeah. So, so yeah. <laughs> I've kind of forgot we make a list of actual coasters okay. we want to highlight. Schroeder's Kanan is probably one of the best roller coasters that we have not ridden. Everyone talks about it all the time. I'm going to take everyone's word for it, but it's our yeah. team members, which yeah. obviously we value very much. Yeah. But also friends from around the world that have ridden it. They, everyone says, keeps telling me. Sven says that it's like the best roller coaster. Isn't it like his ever. favorite? Yeah. So, Sven, I misquote you. I'm yeah. sorry. But, uh, it's at least in his top three for like the whole continent. So. That's pretty intense. Yeah. That's crazy. Um, and, like, yeah, I went to Hansa Park in 2013. That was obviously years before Schroeder's Kanem was built. Uh, but Flux von Lodgerad is absolutely no slouch. That ride is a badass. It was so ahead of its time. It's a dark ride. It's a launch coaster. And it's an indoor Eurofighter all in one. The only problem, I think Akiwi's heel for Gershlauer is their fulfillment because not all Gershlauers are built the same. Some Gershlauers have been open for 20 years and they still run like a dream. And some Gershlauers suck from the day they were built, like Huracan at Volantis. And I don't know, like, like Untamed at Canopy Lake, which is not a good ride, it all comes down to fulfillment, and I guess what I'm saying is that I wish every Gershlauer was as good as the really good ones. I feel like Americans don't have the best impression of Gershlauers. Um, it's definitely getting better. Rides like Monster at Adventureland and... and um, Hang Time and Knott's Berry Farm are showing the whole world um, like what Gerschlauer is really capable of. You get a ride. You know, now that they're moving away from like shoulder harnesses, that was the biggest complaint. Like, I'm a huge fan of Mystery Mind at Dollywood, but a lot of people don't like getting their ears boxed, and I respect that. But now we've got rides like their Infinity Coaster line. It really is sky's the limit. Like, okay, no, it's cool because there's one of the things we really talk about uh, a lot in this podcast in particular. It's kind of like how some manufacturers create this niche. And they've done a really good job to stand out because, again, what we mentioned just a couple of seconds ago is their bub set coaster is just taking that wild mouse but, like, making it a product that's so applicable for custom projects. Mm-hmm. It feels like any park can do their own unique ride without having to, like, break the bank but still have quality, have something unique, combine yeah. several family aspects for one product, but then also they did it with the, with the Eurofighter. Eurofighter. The reason they penetrated this market to begin with is because they were able to create a carve out a niche and be like, yeah. well, you want a looper and you don't have any money and here's one of these production models that will get you a looping coaster with a vertical drop out of control. A beyond vertical. Your audience that may not be used to roller so coasters marketable. loves it. There were some of the most marketable products and coasters ever introduced to the market, especially for the modern market. And that's why they exist. And now they've grown in to be a manufacturer to make stuff like now they Takabisha build hyper and hyper coasters, you know, and and, um, and like Fury Fury and, and Bobby on land, like they build Gold Rush launch coasters happened. that go eighty miles per hour, two hundred feet really, in the air. Really, yeah, it's, it's one of the greatest success stories, in my opinion. Wood coasters, Mammoth. Also at Urban Spark Trip I mean, Show. Prefab, but yeah. But it's Gerschlauer design. Gerschlauer trains, too. Gerschlauer, if you want it, Gerschlauer will build it. When we were at- Another thing that Gerschlauer really stood apart with, in order for them to penetrate the market to begin with, they had to be the manufacturer who built anything you yep. wanted, which is why a lot of projects have been shot down by manufacturers when they're approached, if it's too hard, or the designing cost will go way through the roof. But Gerschlauer will do it. And that's, you know, again, how that's they how really market, penetrate the market. At Gronelund. Yep. Vilda Musen. Musen. Gronelund told us the story of how they went to every manufacturer they could find, every purveyor of Wild Mouse designers, and they had their little model of Jetline with, like, a piece of thread woven through the superstructure, and they are like, can you build us a roller coaster that looks like this? And everyone else said no. Gerschlauer was the only one that said yes. They were like, we will build you a Wild Mouse that is wrapped around your... Zero and Schwarzkopf hybrid looping or non-looping coaster. And they just attached it to the existing... That ride has, like, the super beefy superstructure for what was supposed to be a decorative mountain. Um, the one that was in Japan uh, had the actual decorative mountain, but the one for Grunelund never did. So they had this superstructure that was really beefy, and they're like, we've got enough support here. We could build another roller coaster on this, so... Gerschlauer built a whole roller coaster that was welded to an existing roller coaster, and that's one of the best coasters, man. And then they that introduced that family coaster line. Um, oh, they have, they have great several, family coasters. They have several different production models, also a bunch of custom models, like, like the Fire new Tokyo Chaser Tokyo City Express, or Fire Chaser Coaster Express, on. Park Asterix's uh, Pegasus Express. Yeah. So they really introduced another line. that and Dragonfly. They were introduced um, to, the, uh, to the market. Dynamo. 
Yeah, yeah, which is the same. So it's, a, it's a 360 family coaster yeah. model. Um, oh yeah, Belantis has one too. So it's actually one we we picked six major manufacturers to focus on in this episode or in these these two episodes between these podcasts. Um, and Gerslauer is one of them because Gerslauer really. Yeah, again, it's a success story. It you has know? some cool rides. The, the Skyfly and Sky Rollers are super neat. Like, and the cool thing is that even though it's it's a company that came through with having production models as their big base breakthrough mm-hmm. into the market, um, it is a well-rounded manufacturer. Done so many projects that are unique to the parks they're located in. I mean, again, speak of all these bobsled coasters, Germany's full of them. Yeah, Europe is full of them, and they are just they are. Gems. They are mm-hmm. amazing rides, and I need that to be in the U.S. Like a vast majority of Gerschlauers are amazing. In fact, I don't think they build – they haven't built a bad coaster in a very long time. I don't think I did like – I mean, some are a little rough, like you mentioned earlier. Um, what's it called? In Huracan Tennessee? and um, Mystery – well, Mystery, Mystery – I Mine. love Mystery Mine, but like Canopy Lakes Untamed like gave the company a bad rap, and so did like Huracan at Balantis, but – they don't really do a lot of coasters with shoulder harnesses anymore. And even, like, their last most recent shoulder harness coasters, like Smiler. Everybody loves Smiler. I never thought that they could build, that Alton Towers would ever build a roller coaster that was as talked about and, 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 and enigmatic as Nemesis. But Smiler, we talk to Europeans all the time who say that it's, their favorite coaster in Great Britain, one of their top coasters in Europe, like one of their oh my God, do we even favorite talk about their spinning coasters. Oh, uh, and the spinning coasters. They have like some of the best spinning coasters around. Including yeah, the custom U.S. never got coasters. any bobsled coasters, but we did get their spinning coasters, which are the bobsled coasters with spinning cars. So, got a bunch of those. So yeah, the, this this manufacturer is there's great ones all in the around. U.S. All the Six Flags parks that have them. Um, Spin Runway at Yomiuri Land, an indoor spinning coaster that's also a dark ride. Um, Geki on Live Coaster at Joyopolis, which is a spinning coaster, a video game, like a rhythm video game where the ride controller is on your seat. A launch it's coaster. It's a launch coaster, and, and it, it goes upside version. down. And it's indoor. And it's indoor. It's like everything. So yeah, Gerschlauer is everything. It's a really good cool manufacturer. Will do it. If you want it, Gerschlauer will do it all, and they'll do it well. And uh, the more I think about it, I wish it was more awesome to talk about and in the modern schematics, because we always mention B and M, Intman, and RMC is a big one for the fanboys out there, yeah. and Mac, and then Vacoma is now really become, starting to become a topic again, especially in our content. Yeah. Um, but Gerschlauer cannot be forgotten. Yeah. And then we're going to finish this episode. Yeah, speaking we're of RMC, we're going to we're gonna, to the, the 90-minute mark. horn here. So we're going to uh, move on to... We've got a couple minutes left. SNS, and, Asensei yeah. Technologies, which... Um, it's a pretty cut-and-dry and dry thing. Um, There's not that many products to talk about, but they have some really, really good really products. Dinaconda and Ejanaka are two of the best roller coasters we've ever ridden. It's They're two of the best roller coasters we will ever ride. And I will say that Donaconda nailed it. Like, third time was a charm. Yeah. Ejanaika is really, really good. But then they took Ejanaika and they made it a little more manageable size. Um, better Donaconda is out of control. Better capacity. Like, I feel like I'm continuously, yeah. like, no, nowhere in my seat. Spectacular. That ride really, really messed with me. As for Ejanaika is really cool, but it was so large that some of the yeah. elements didn't quite throw me away. a little more hang time in the peaks of the elements than, than Danaconda. Where Danaconda is just stuff. It's almost like if you took Skyrush, but it also have flipping seats. Yeah. Danaconda. Yeah, this, I, Danaconda is X2 plus Skyrush. <laughs> yeah, Skyrush with X2 trains. We have decided. Yeah, um, I was going along a picture from the other day when we were like riding for the first time. And then... It was uh, kind of funny. The, the thing that really made SNS famous, of course, was their use of pneumatics. Their, their the air-powered air launch coasters and... Air launch coasters are the future because you just cannot get a rate of acceleration that dramatic any other way. Um, Dolta Dumpa may not be our favorite coaster in the world, but God, that launch is just something else. Um, our number one bucket list coaster in the United States is Max Force, like without a shadow of a doubt. We cannot wait to take on that amazing ass pneumatic launch. The layout looks cool. Like, I love the shape of it. It's, it's, Max Force is a completely, totally unique experience. Like, there's nothing in the world that looks like that ride, and I'm sure there's nothing in the world that rides like it. Even the, the Thrust Air 3000 coasters in China um, probably feel like a totally different beast than Max Force. So, hooray for that. Hooray for... They actually just opened another one of those thrusters uh, yeah. in China. I'm trying to find the name real quick. Um, it's at the bottom. Launch coaster. Is that it? Oh, yeah, Central Park. Park. Yeah, it's like over in Shandong or something. Yeah, it's in Shanghai. Yeah, it is in Shanghai. Um, 
Ooh, that's a beautiful really cool. entrance. Wow, it looks really sophisticated. It's cute. It's another one of those theme parks in China that I really like. We, we really tried to ride the one in Shenzhen on our last visit. It was down. Okay, guys. Happy Valley our Shenzhen. Happy Valley Shenzhen visit was shit. There yeah. was like only the SC was open, which the SC was really, really good. good. But like we came. Happy Valley Shenzhen things. broke our hearts. Like I can't believe they even sold us a ticket. I mean, I can because it's China, but like. Literally, the only coaster open was the SLC. Everything no. else was, like, under maintenance, which, like, whatever. It's funny. RCDB still lists this new launch coaster as under construction, as under construction but yeah. it has opened because we had Get video it, footage RCDB. Love of Roller Coaster Dream. Um, but yeah. the telephone number for the park? Okay. That's <laughs> <laughs> I got all excited. You should text them. Like, no. They don't, they don't, they don't have no WeChat. It's Trump. Okay. We can't no. get WeChat anymore. <laughs> and TikTok is slowly withering away might before our very eyes. Okay. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I cannot wait for uh, more pneumatic launch coasters because, like, the rate of acceleration on these things, it, I can still remember. The first one that I ever rode was actually, um, actually, the first one that I rode was Powder Cake. Grossly underrated. Um, but the first of the big ones, oh, yeah, the one that in Shenzhen that I rode in 2015, that thing took off. I thought my rib cage was going to cave in. Like, <laughs> it, the, the, the launch is so fast. I mean, I remember that from Dodo Dumpa, too. It's like, the launch is so fast that your peripheral vision cannot process the rate of change that your eyes are featuring. So it just, you get tunnel vision. You get tunnel vision on these launch coasters because you go so fast so quickly that your brain cannot wrap itself around it. Um, yeah, I think it's gray, it's blur. So, it's like super gray. S and S coasters, there may not be very many of them, but damn, like. Just speaking of Arcool, I want to give a shout out to their. The 40 free spins. The free spins. But mainly Only to Arashi. Arashi. Because, like, the U.S. ones are super trimmed, and I think Batman yeah. is still the best one like, in San Antonio, in not, not Discovery. Yeah. Um, but Arashi in Tokyo is, like, out of... I mean, in, uh, Nagoya. in Nagoya, it's out of control. Nagashima like, Nagashima Spa Land. Land's version of this thing. We're going to talk about Nagashima Spa Girl, Land I I was dying. in the next one. Like, the dying. next podcast when we oh talk about Schwarzkopf and we talk about Steel Dragon 2000. You know what we've got to talk about? What? The Togo um, Elder Twisters. Oh, my God. What? Nagashima the whole Spa Land talking about the Tokyo section. I mean, us. the China, the Japan section was. We were uh, looking at pictures of Nagashima Spa Land, and we just remembered to talk about how <laughs> epic remember. the Ultra. I mean, we should. yeah. So now we're officially over ninety minutes. We're probably going to need to do. Need to we're probably going to do a Togo episode. Tbh, like we're going to have a whole fucking season. Ultra Twisters are all of this. exceptional. If you had the opportunity to ride the Ultra Twister that came to America from Japan, it was not Togo International. It was. It came to Six Flags Great Adventure on a boat and blew everyone away. And then it went to Astro World and blew everyone away. Including the lift till. Oh. Yep. <laughs> and they redid the lift till because the state was like, you can't open a roller coaster with a vertical lift. Which is fair because we it's rode the Elder, Elder Twisters yeah. and like, I did not ever want to get stuck on that because yeah. I don't even know how the hell to get out. Like, that I'm was just scared thinking about it. That, that was the coaster we rode the most at Nagashima. We rode it four times. Yeah, it was fun. It was really wild. Fan freaking tastic ride. Um, but yeah, um, so with Ultra Twister, we're gonna Ultra Twist out of here. Yeah, <laughs> we're actually gonna record the next yeah. episode for you guys. Now we're on a roll. Yeah, but um, check back in about two weeks from this, or maybe a week from this uh, this launch, depending on when we when this goes live. Thank you so much for listening. Um, check out thecoastkings.com. Leave us a review on our podcast. Follow us on our social media, and make sure to check into the second half of the list, including RMC, BNM, Vacoma. Gravity, Gravity Group. group. Uh, we're gonna talk about some weird stuff like um, we gun, the mountain coasters, Caripro, Caripro, single rail suspended coaster, and like some Perla. We grow some of the weirdest Imperlas that end up being our favorites. So surprise, surprise! See yeah. you next episode. More. To come. Woo. Woo. Bye. Bye.